Hey guys, this is Lawrence of the Ketones and Coffee Podcast. Make sure to subscribe down below so you don't miss out on any of this great content. I'm so excited for this, guys. Our guest today is a trained PhD biochemist, a certified primal health coach, and a nutrition network advisor. As a health coach, his mission is to help others accomplish reversal of type 2 diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. I'm so excited for this. I'm here with Dr. Peter Delanoy. Dr. Pete, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be on your show with you. I hope I said your last name right. Did I say that right? You killed it. It was a g- uh, good job because usually, usually it's the other way around. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So this is fantastic, doc, um, Dr. Pete, because I love having you here. Your story will really, you know, resonates with me because my parents are uh, diabetics and my listeners would, you know, love to hear more about your story and my podcast is all about that and how we can impact many many people's lives through our story and i'd like to my listeners to get to know more about you before we get to your story can you briefly give us a little bit more about yourself and what you do mostly nowadays well i i'm a career uh teacher so mm-hmm. i retired recently um from 28 years i i taught at all levels um I was a university professor for a while, and then uh, I went to the secondary level, high school, and uh, I spent 15 years of the 28 Mm -hmm. teaching for a school called Basis, uh, where I taught 7th grade all the way through 12th graders, all all parts Mm -hmm. of chemistry. Uh, But my, my formative training was in the area of biochemistry. That's what my PhD Mm -hmm. is in. And I was a research scientist uh, for a while. And uh, in two, I'm also a rock climber, a career rock climber and a mountaineer. And I need to to just bring that up because it's influenced my attitude and how I see life when I too was diagnosed with chronic diseases. And uh, for me, that was, it started in 2016. I was diagnosed with gout and Mm. I'm a specialist in that area now. And then in 2019, I was diagnosed with prediabetes. Mm, and, yeah. um, and at the time, I didn't understand that the two things were actually related. We'll, we'll, we can get into that we'll today. Get, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But you said 27 years as a, as a teacher. That's quite a long time. Yeah, I was there a long mm. time. And then mm. uh, in, in my journey, once diagnosed with prediabetes, uh, and and having found my way to the low carb lifestyle and was able to reverse that condition mm. actually very rapidly, yeah. Uh, I became interested in uh, in two things really: educating people about how we end up with diabetes and things like gout, mm. and then second to that, along with my daughter, we started a company to um, coach people and help them um, go through this process hopefully without all the pain and suffering that that uh that i have had because uh when i started down that road i all i had basically what were the papers that verta health had originally published Mm. and now of course yeah we know a lot more and it's it's a lot easier for people uh if they're open to it to understand the low carb Mm. lifestyle and yeah, you know the benefits of it. That's a big question, huh? Uh, if they're yes. open, so I want to get to your story here. I believe that we can absolutely impact a lot of people just by having you here and changes someone's life. That's the goal, and um, I love what you and your daughter is doing, and it's much needed in, in this society today because there's a lot of there's an epidemic going on with obesity, type two diabetes, all you know, lots you know, chronic illness, um, which is a which is also called the lifestyle disease, right? And and this, like we, I, um, we, I talked about this before we went live. The topic is really near and dear to my heart because both of my parents are diabetic. My my dad, he uh, he's been diagnosed with type two, and my mom, he's pre diabetic. She's on low carb now, but it hasn't been easy for her to stay consistent. So, I'm afraid uh, for her too, actually, which is something that you know a lot of, a lot about, you know, through experience. Um, having someone accomplish what you accomplished on, on the show, um, talking about this subject, which is, you know, reversing chronic illness through a ketogenic diet. 
just some context and i promise you know this leads to the topic where we want we want to discuss today so my dad my dad don't like sweets and doesn't drink a lot of you know coke and pepsi and what have you but you know it was a complete shock to him that he had been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes so his conclusion was it must run in the family which is for me dangerous because not because it's not true it can run in your family if you have that gene but it can also be a crutch to use an, as an excuse not to try right and this and that so a lot like you know maybe your story is a little similar and we have a chance today to sort of help people get ahead of this thing so i understand that you are a very active individual we talked about you know being an athlete a uh, uh, mountain climber uh crossfit you've dabbled a little bit um and you already observed what you eat um a healthy diet and yet you still found yourself in this predicament tell us your story because you were diagnosed with pre-diabetes and what has led to that hey guys let me tell you about this delivery service that's been a total game changer for my lifestyle did you know that it's now possible to get local fresh groceries delivered right at your doorstep well instacart gives you unlimited grocery delivery for one low monthly fee and if I can avoid buying non-keto friendly items from supermarkets who psychs you into buying unhealthy foods, plus if it saves me a lot of time and money, sign me up. Instacart is hand selected by shoppers based on your preferences so no more rock hard avocados and they will keep your eggs safe too. And Instacart will find everything you usually buy and get smart suggestions for new items. And you can get your first order today delivered for free when you purchase over $35 by following the link on the show notes below to let Instacart know that I sent you and to help to support the show. Instacart, never step foot in the grocery store again. Well, prior to the, to the pre-diabetes, uh, I, I, was, uh, I was eating the standard American diet. Um, with some things that were part of it that I just passed off as being okay because mm. I was a fairly active individual. And I believe like a lot of people, I think that uh, it's fair to say maybe the masses believe this way, that if you're exercising enough that y you can work off whatever you're putting in your mouth. And, and, yeah. and that goes back to this argument of calories, you know, um, which the food industry collectively uses to argue to people that, you know, it doesn't really matter what you eat. If it's a, if it, if, if it is a Coca-Cola, it's not mm -hmm. the Coca-Cola's fault. It's because you're not going out and exercising enough. So at the time, and it's important for me to talk about this because people don't understand that all of these chronic diseases, these metabolic diseases are are being driven by the same central biochemistry. They, they need to understand that. And that, so for me, that journey started when I was diagnosed with gout, mm. but I didn't understand at the time. Uh, and, and gout is still out there treated as, as if it's this annoying, I call it the bastard uh, stepchild of chronic disease. It's treated like it's a severe headache and that it's not connected to anything else. But in 2016, if, if the doctors that, that I saw who diagnosed the gout understood that they should look at other biomarkers at the time, I, I might have been able to pick up the prediabetes three years earlier than I did. Mm. And uh, to go back to, I think, your central question, what was I eating at the time? All right, I was, I was drinking two to three beers every single day. I was eating what I call the standard American diet. So if you were to look at a plate, there would be a very large portion of carbohydrates on there, uh, potatoes, rice, you know, um, grains, um, whatever. And then there, there was protein and, uh, you know, some, some vegetables, right? Um, but basically a standard American plate. Um, and then I usually had either chocolate that, that had added sugar in it uh, or ice cream after dinner. And I rationalized that lifestyle that I could do that because I, I was active enough and I would burn the calories off. What, what I didn't understand at the time was that the, the main, well, I didn't know anything about the main biochemical driver of this, and I hope we get to talk about mm -hmm. that. But 
I didn't understand that none of this has to do with calories. And, and that may fly in the face of what I, <laughs> I imagine some of your viewers are going to go, what is this guy talking about? It's, it's not about the calories. It's about how they're processed that's driving, that's driving these diseases. So, you know, it was, and in the beginning, I think I, with my story, when I was diagnosed with the prediabetes, that's the thing that really scared the heck out of me because mm. uh, the uh, the prognosis down the road, right? Thinking about the email that my doctor wrote me was that you, there's nothing you can do about this. Uh, just exercise more. Um, and they, he, he said that. Yeah. And, and, uh, and live a, a healthier, uh, eat the Mediterranean diet. Well, the thing is, and it's important for me to mention here, is is that I was doing that already because in 2016, I was diagnosed with gout. Mm. So I had cut my alcohol consumption back. Although by the time of the prediabetes, I think I was really, I was back to two or three beers every day. Um, but I was eating a Mediterranean diet at that point, except I, I was, I had added more carbohydrates the rice and the potatoes and things to my plate because uh, starting in 2016, I joined a CrossFit gym and mm. I was doing CrossFit five or six times a week. Um, mm. And I'm 64 now so that everyone can kind of get a handle on my age, where, where I am age wise. And when I started the CrossFit, I was 57. Anyone that knows about CrossFit and I'm still a CrossFit athlete, knows that it's super in intense. intense. A lot intense. of people, they won't even walk into a CrossFit gym because they are just like, I can't do that. Mm. So when I got the email from my, from my doctor in 2019 on the prediabetes, I was actually super offended. I want to ask you about that. Sorry to cut you off. I want to ask you about no, that. No, is, no. Is, it, is it from an annual checkup or was it completely accidental or is it something that you've been uh dealing with for a while and you you want to get a check yeah i made the choice to, after the gout thing mm. and i started the crossfit my reason to go to see the doctor uh was because i i wanted to um see if my cardiovascular system had improved you know if my blood pressure went down um what my i expected my biomarkers to look excellent for example mm -hmm. uh and so I was totally shocked by the mm. pre-diabetic diagnosis. And additionally, the doctor didn't even measure uric acid. You know, so I, I mean, I'm looking back on this now, the hindsight. And uric acid mm. is considered the key marker for gout. Why, you know, we can ask about that. Why in the examination didn't they look for that marker? Because my doctor knew about my gout history. And... Uric acid is a prominent marker of metabolic uh, disease. Um, so why didn't they look at that? And then the implication that, uh, or, or the suggestion to me that I needed to exercise more and double down on the Mediterranean diet really made me angry because it was like, my doctor knew I was a CrossFit athlete. And so honestly, I didn't know how much more I could possibly exercise during the week. I, I want to go back to you talking about your gout, you know, three years before you got, got diagnosed with prediabetes. Are you saying gout is a s somewhat uh, like, bef is, it, is it somewhat connected uh, type 2 diabetes and uh, being diabetic and gout? Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. 25%, a full quarter of gout sufferers are also type 2 diabetic. 71% Se of them have chronic kidney disease. 74% of them are hypertensive. About 15% of them have cardiovascular disease. And a significant mm -hmm. portion will, will have a, a combination of those metabolic diseases going on at the same time. When you flip this on its head and you ask, okay, somebody who's my age, 60 years old, what is the percentage of those individuals that are pre-diabetic or full type 2? And it's over 
over 50% of our of the US population is uh, overweight and obese. In fact, the percentage is actually higher than that when you when you combine overweight overweightness with the obesity question. And about 50% of our population is suffering from some level of cardiovascular uh, disease. And all of everything that we're talking about is driven mm -hmm. by fructose uric acid metabolism and mm -hmm. its connection to the glycolytic pathway that ties into the mitochondria. So you, you mentioned earlier about your father, that he's not eating sugar, he doesn't drink Coca-Cola. But if you step back from that and you ask, okay, what are the main drivers mm. of, of, of this condition, this set of conditions that we're talking about? And I, I'll come back to the genetics thing that you mentioned in a minute. Uh, we need to talk about that for a minute because these guys will play that card all the time. But uh, the, the, the main three drivers I call the deadly triad. So you have alcohol, you have hyperglycemia, elevated glucose, and you have fructose, which is coming in via added sugars. Mm. Now, there's quite a few people that, that will say, well, I don't drink alcohol, so I, I, you know, I, I'm not affected this way. Okay, fine. If, if they have spent decades eating the standard American diet in one form or another, then they're having five or six meals every single day that uh, almost assuredly have high glucose levels in that meal. And if they're eating processed food as a function of those meals, then they're also getting the added sugar. And then one, one other, which brings in the fructose. And uh, what, what the, people don't realize about the pathway that I'm talking about is that the hyperglycemia actually causes the production of endogenous fructose in the liver. You actually make fructose in the liver. And in the liver, the fructose is handled without any feedback mechanisms. It's quantitatively converted, mm. essentially downstream, most of it into uric acid. So you get this sudden acute rise in uric acid which is a signaling molecule that's driving the fat accumulation in, in the liver. It reprograms the, the mitochondria uh, to stop burning, to produce uh, mm -hmm. energy. And, uh, and downstream, you're going to have insulin resistance, which you probably have heard about before. And, and out of that, you're going to have this cassette of diseases mm -hmm. that usually people uh, will be experiencing in one form or another. So people that are significantly obese, they may also be type two diabetic, or they perhaps that they are perhaps are gout sufferers, or it's uh, one of the main killers of type two diabetes is the cardiovascular disease, which is all being driven by this central mechanism. Now, in my own experience as a coach, and it sounds like you've experienced this as well is that when you start to talk to family members who are, who are, are uh, admittedly and knowingly suffering from these chronic diseases, of which I have extended mm -hmm. family members that are, and you start talking to them about this issue, the, uh, it's very common for them to go, well, I think I have the gene for cardiovascular disease. It's in my, it's in my family line, you know? And it's like, okay, stop. That's not how it works, right? Mm -hmm. uh, hu humans, we, we, first off, we don't have single genes for things, right? We're, we're a very complex multicellular organism. And our genes the, the, uh, work in units of many genes together, and they influence the expression of each other. And, whether, whether pe and people don't like to hear the next part of this. But, but our environment influences this complex expression. And so, the, you know, the next question that they'll ask is like, what do you mean by environment? So we can talk about the food environment. You know, if you're eating this uh, regime every single day, five or six uh, meals a day, there, there's significant snacking in there. 
and uh, it's hyperglycemic with a lot of simple sugars like glucose and the fructose coming in, um, you're providing a food environment that activates this central biochemical pathway that drives these diseases. And when you, you add up the decades on this, that's how guys like me, you know, when I was 57, suddenly show up with gout. A few years later, it's the pre-diabetes thing. And you're sitting there going, well, how the heck did I get here? I want to I want to cut you off there for a second there because this is really important to talk about and you've talked about so many great things about um it's not about calories it's about how we metabolize food um we need to explain this to people in a way they will understand and I I want to associate what happened to you because you had that you said you were horrified and I would be I would be horrified too um, knowing all of this information. I want to ask you this question because I have people around me with full-blown type 2 diabetes and couldn't be bothered with a lifestyle change. And I think, I believe, your story with your doctor when the, your doctor broke down the news to you is it's like not, it's like there's nothing you could do. Just do this. As simple as that. Like there's, it, it's not, I don't want your doctor to scare people, but I want your doctor to be able to give you the prognosis on what, can actually happen if you go down this route, right? And I think for me, what sticks out to me with your story is you were, there's fear that you associate with this. Um, you know what's going to happen. You know that if you went down this path and you called it a silent killer too, which is, I think, um, really important because people cannot be bothered with a lifestyle change. And when your doctor says there's nothing you could do, just exercise more. It's like, I know your doctor doesn't want to scare you, but at the same time, he's saying, you know, there's nothing you could do. Just don't worry about it. Just do this. Like it's, it's like, that's why people are not, you know, interested in making a lifestyle change because it's so they, they broke, they break it down to you. Like it's nothing. Well, uh, yeah, and what I didn't say is that in the email, it, it went on to explain that as time progressed, that they had, uh, you know, many fine medications that, that, that they would put me on. And, and if you're my age and you watch the six o'clock news, right, just look at the advertisements that are being directed at my age group, right? It's just one di diabetes drug after another. It's one cardiovascular drug after another. And they even say in the advertisements that these drugs are only treating the symptoms. They don't treat underlying cause. And if you, if you listen to other experts out there, like Robert Lustig, for example, uh, and maybe read his book called Metabolical, um, he's very clear about this. These chronic diseases that we're talking about, they're not druggable. There are no drugs that work on the central cause of these diseases. They work on symptoms. So when you combine that philosophy with the email that I got, yeah, it scared the hell out of me. Because look, I'm 60 years old. And uh, I, what's going to happen in the next 30 years? If I can get to 90, right? And my wife is actually, uh, she's expressed an interest in getting to 100, right? And I also looked at my family history. And when I looked at that and I saw that my own parents, you know, were significantly sick. And, and like I said, this was uh, hindsight, right? I, I didn't know any of this starting in 2016 or 2019. And now what I know, I look back and even my siblings, they're, they are metabolically sick. Mm. They're going to be lucky if they live past 70, very, very far, right? And, and the, the level of incapacitation was significant. You know, my father died at 78, and the last eight years of his life, he was incapacitated. My, my wife, or not my wife, uh, my mom died earlier than that. And again, her level of incapacitation. So one of the biggest problems I have with people that are my age, uh, when given the opportunity, 
right? When you lay this out in front of them and you say, look, the truth is, if you've been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes, the reality is you're actually standing right in that moment. You're standing at a fork in the road. You can choose the medical establishment and, and listen to that, that business that, you know, if you start exercising more and eat Mediterranean, okay, there's truth in that. You'll slow the progression down. And then when you when it starts to catch up with you, the kidney disease, the blindness, you know, uh, the, the vascular issues in your extremities, feet mainly with diabetics facing amputations, we have some really good medications for you. And we can push that inevitability off, right? That's one fork in the road. The other fork in the road is that you can, you can eat low carb and you can reverse the condition and you can get your health back. Mm. Is, and it's not just about the food, right? So some parts of what the medical establishment say are true. You got to modulate your stress levels. You got to, you know, you have to look at your sleep uh, and, and exercise is uber important. I mean, I can't uh, de-emphasize that at all. When you have the American Diabetes Association coming out with statements like diabetes is incurable and it is chronic, you'll absolutely have to be on medication. It doesn't help the case. It doesn't help the case. Um, no, it makes it worse. Makes it worse. Absolutely. When you said it didn't make sense to you, I, I want to get back to that. When when you were diagnosed, it, it's going to be everyone's reaction, obviously, because from the outside looking in, you observe a healthy lifestyle. You are a very active individual. Is it is it because diabetes is only tied to sugar, not carbs? I want to explain this to people. You've um, explained this eloquently with you know the, the pathway earlier, but I want to explain this to people in layman's terms because if diabetes is not because like like I said my fa my father my dad he's um he he did not expect this because he he doesn't like to eat sweets and that only gives me um the I I believe that they tie it to sugar too much not carbs like is where's that disconnect there do you think Okay I agree. I totally I love what you just said that you have the establishment yeah they try to separate added sugar away from from carbs and so let's let's try to break this down i think i need to say at the front end of this before, though as we start to break this down that uh as a coach and an investigator in this type of metabolism i have come to realize and there's there's actually pretty good science for this now that the intake of carbohydrates in particular fructose which can come in through fruit, right? Uh, and, and other sources that, that people don't even realize uh, can drive sugar addiction. Now, I realize that what I'm saying is controversial, but you know what? I don't even care about that anymore. This, it, when you look at the science, it's really scary. And we know that fructose can have a direct effect in the brain to activate a protein that's called delta Fos B, which all of the substance abuse people through decades of, of laboratory work, have concluded that delta Fos B drives the addictive state. So, and then in my coaching experience, every single client that I have had, the biggest challenge that we've had with them is not teaching them how to eat low carb. That's, it's pretty easy to do. You know, here's a, here's a food list. You've got to learn how to uh, do some new cooking right? To think how to really uh, build your repertoire of recipes. That just takes a little bit of time. It's actually, I believe, fairly easy to eat low carb. Where the challenge comes in is getting these people to stop eating mm. food items that are high in carbs, that, the, uh, that they overeat, and that the establishment claims are healthy carbohydrates. Now, in so... One of the first things I see with clients, for example, is especially the ones that have this connection to the brain chemistry that's driving the overeating of carbohydrates uh, is, is with fruit. 
when they go low carb, they they will start bringing fruit in uh, to their morning, uh, and they'll they'll really pump up what they're eating there, as far as the amounts go. And the reason they're doing that is because of the significant cravings for for those. So, you know what I tell young people about this lifestyle is that you need to moderate the alcohol for sure because it activates this pathway. Uh, you need to stop doing the hyperglycemia, you know, and that's going to not just include sugary items like eating a muffin. Mm -hmm. That that means that you stop with potatoes, the rice, uh, and other sugary, like large amounts of fruit. And you push back really hard on the added sugars that bring in fructose directly. That's the problem where I have with people because they don't know where it's coming from. They don't know that, you know, they, they would say it's fruit. Yeah, but it, it should be healthy, right? Because it's fruit and... Um, the argument, right? I've, I've, I hear it all the time. And even when you listen to Lustig or Johnson, they're going to say, mm -hmm. okay, let's deal with the piece of fruit thing. Yeah, it does have fiber in it, but... In our food process, in our food producing system, it's not the same fruit as it was a couple of million years ago. These guys have genetically engineered this stuff now so that it's larger Sweeter. and it has more fructose in it. Uh, and the reason they want more fructose in it is because fructose is so significantly more sweet than glucose. And it uh, super activates the taste sensors in the tongue. It activates the uh, the, the taste receptors and and other metabolic sensors that are in the intestine, and it hyper activates the food reward system in the brain, so the dopamine release, and it hyper activates the well, it activates the production of delta phos B. Okay, these guys know about this stuff, and they've known about it for a really really long time. So uh, the, the message that Lustig is delivering is correct. What we need people to do is start eating whole, real food. You cut it up and you cook it yourself. Yes. But we also understand that for a full-blown type 2 diabetic, if they want to reverse their condition, they're going to have to be really careful about fruit. If you're compromised, if, if you're already metabolically compromised. Absolutely. So if this was your dad talking to me and I was coaching him, I'd be like, okay, man, 20 grams total carbs per day. I don't care what type of carb it is. Mm. You're not going to exceed that and don't eat sugar at all. He probably wouldn't know right. where carbs were coming from. Like he would, he would, it would take a lot of education. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to give them food lists. You're going to talk about what acceptable carbs mm. are. You know, we have the green listed vegetables which have acceptable carbs, also high in fiber, and all of those kinds of things. And I teach the plate method because it's simple. And it doesn't involve having to uh, count calories, which I don't believe in. All right, so you have a plate. And on that plate, what one uh, segment of it will have protein in it, uh, chicken, uh, steak, or pork, or, you know, fish and it should be the size of a fat wallet mm. or maybe a little bit more. I mean, you have to ask questions. How active is this individual? And then the other two portions of the plate are going to have fist size, green listed vegetables that have been cooked in a, you know, in a variety of ways, like, like broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, um, Brussels sprouts. Um, I, I mean, there's a whole list of these things, zucchini, yellow squash, and there's a lot of ways you can cook them. And this is a metaphor, what I'm describing to you. So you have to teach, you have to teach these guys how they should be eating. And the conflict that you're raising about the fact that they don't know is a really good one. Because I'll tell you this too about the people that I work with. They'll claim flat out, I'm not eating sugar. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, but you are eating sugar. They just don't understand how often all the is ways that? it's coming. Pardon? How often is that with your clients that they're so... Every single one Confused. of them that I start to work with. Yeah. 
They don't understand, for example, the sauces that go on on food. What needs to happen? Where's the disconnect? So we 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 talked about how they're not uh, able to connect where the sugar is coming from. Obviously, we're gonna give them a list list of foods that they can eat and list of foods that they cannot. Like, do you give them both the list of they can't eat or and? Yes, okay. they get a list that has green listed vegetables, yellow listed veg, mm. uh, not just vegetables, green listed foods, mm. yellow listed foods, and then the red ones. And the red ones are you're not allowed to eat them at all. And then depending on the condition of the individual, like if, if this was a full on type two diabetic, I'm going to tell them you can't touch the yellow ones either. They're off the list for now, you know. If, if we can get down the road with this individual, and, and there are other things you got to teach them about, like the whole idea of going into a store now or into a shopping center for food is now they have to be educated about mm. that. They need to stay out of the aisles because the aisles, somewhere around 74, 80% of the food in that store is in the aisles. And it's all processed. It has tons of sugar in it, along with other things that also contribute to these, to these diseases. But I, I don't want to get off on a tangent yeah. about that. They need to stay on the outside yeah. of the store. I, I want to ask you, um, let's say they want to make a change, but sometimes that's not enough. One thing sometimes is not enough. What what needs to happen in them to be able to, you know, stay consistent and actually, you know, take control of their health and start reversing this di uh, diagnosis? Like what needs to happen? I, I know one thing is not enough. Like what needs to happen in them? They really have to desire it, right? They have to desire it. They have to be willing to make a commitment. If they're not scared and about it and if they're not, uh, if they think that this is um, in, in their family, running in their family, you know, some, some of these people won't even try because, okay, my doctor said, you know, it's, it cannot be reversed. It's, uh, it's this and that. And we, we're sounding like we're conspiracy theorists here because of that. And, that's what I'm afraid of, but go ahead. Sorry to cut you off. No, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head. So I already brought up one factor. One factor is, is that the relationship that most, most people have with sugar is significantly more serious than they think. You know, the easiest client that I've ever had to deal with still had cravings that we had to work through. And the hardest clients of which I'm still working with have binge eating disorder. And it's my my contention that anyone that you you work with is going to fall onto that continuum. Simple cravings on one end, serious eating disorder on the other, and everyone's going to fall somewhere in there. That has to be contended with. Because depending on the on the the seriousness of the craving, there's going to be a tendency for them to always want to go back. Mm. And there are social issues with this. If you have a spouse who thinks, oh my God, low carb, this is woo woo stuff. You know, it's bad for you. The fat's going to kill you. You are not eating that way. That's a real problem because it means that there's going to be a point of contention at every single meal. How about this? They can't and eat red meat because of the uric acid that it may cause. Yeah, but that, okay, so now... Now we're bouncing because, okay, truthfully, you can eat red, red meat with gout. Um, the gout condition is, and putting that in remission is, is part of this story, part of this whole thing. But, but the medical establishment and, and their lack of understanding of the biochemical drivers here has led them to a very simple explanation of gout which turns out to be a false narrative. And that explanation is if you increase the uric acid in your circulatory system coming from the liver, because you ate red meat, let's use your example, that uric acid is going to diffuse in, into your joint where it's going to crystallize and cause this inflammatory event, which is super painful. And, and that assertion, th there's some partial truth in it. Hyperuricemia, having the elevated uric acid, yes, it contributes to gout, but not because it's going into the joint and crystallizing like having a sliver in your finger. 
And it's and this idea has led the medical establishment to to then turn around and say, okay, so if you're suffering from gout, it's really easy for us then. We just look at which food foods cause high uric acid, uh, which of them have high purines, and and then don't eat those. So I don't want to I don't want to leave our conversation that what we were talking about is really really important, except to say to you that. With the gout thing, it's not, it's not nearly as important to be concerned with the protein relative to which of these proteins has a lot of pro purines and therefore is going to raise uric acid. It's, it's rather a question of, of those proteins that elevate uric acid, which ones, if I abuse them, could cause me a problem. So to, to make a long story short, so maybe we can get back to the other issue is that if I'm sitting down and I'm having three beers every single day in the late afternoon and I'm eating a buttload of anchovies, that's probably not a good idea if I'm, if I'm a gout sufferer because you are, you are setting the stage for a gout flare without saying any more about that, which is way more complicated than just crystallizing uric acid. So... You have, going back to the issue of the type 2 di diabetes, you, yeah, I think at the central point, the person has to realize, I'm going to die if I keep eating the way I'm eating. If they can have a realistic look at what, what the work that they are doing with their doctor and see what the reality of that is, the situation is not getting so better. So they have to tie that, this condition to their lifestyle. They have to connect it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Then once they decide that, then then they, if they take a realistic look at the other fork mm -hmm. in the road, wow, okay, if I go low carb, I actually can reverse this condition. So your doctor did told you to eat a Mediterranean diet, which is we were actually doing already. And you did talk about your diabetes actually still progressed. It progressed because in the beginning, I didn't know what I know mm -hmm. now. And... I went home and I said, all right, she said, I need, well, I went home metaphorically and I said to myself, all right, I need to eat Mediterranean. Well, I'm already doing that, but how can I double down? So I increased the load of fruit that I was eating in the morning. I made these massive fruit bowls for my wife and I put the highest quality yogurt mm -hmm. I could get in those, put them, put it in there. And then on my plates at night, I went out and I bought the highest quality, least processed rice I could buy, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, the, the, you know, p the potatoes, I don't know what to say about that. I continued to eat them, right? But I, based on the Mediterranean diet, I didn't think there was any problem with that. But I, I increased the amount of yams with the fiber and stuff like that. Uh, what am I forgetting? Probably something. So the, the, the portion of those quality carbohydrates... I was being told to eat went up, right? I did all that. Meanwhile, I bought myself a, a glucose meter and I was testing my, my blood glucose in the mornings before I would eat and after I was eating. And what did I see? My fasting glucose was just going up and becoming even more erratic. And my blood glucose after eating this uh, double down uh, Mediterranean uh, meal was increasing, right? Uh, the the amount of blood glucose spikes I was seeing after eating uh, fresh black beans, for example, um, high quality black rice, for example, you know, it was pushing into the ranges that the American Diabetes Association claim are you shouldn't do above 140, and. Uh, at one hour. And so I said, all right, this is not working. How are you making sense of it at the time? Like not, if you, di you didn't know what you know now, how are you making sense of it at the time? Because you said you are eating the way your doctors told you to eat and you didn't know potatoes were bad or, or whatnot, but you, you're just following what they told you. Well, how were you? I was freaking, I, I was freaking mm. out. Okay. And I usually don't talk about this on my podcast in detail, but what happened is 
on one particular morning, I had this Mediterranean diet breakfast. And I literally, because of my sensitivity with the blood glucose measurement, had actually weighed out the amount of black beans that I put on my plate with my eggs. And I had that. I tested my blood glucose and it was, it was ele ele elevated above 120. I freaked out and I went to the CrossFit gym and I, I did what no one should do. I am not advocating for this. I beat myself silly, right? I went there and did a high intensity exercise. I killed myself. Mm -hmm. I had this mentality, which happens to be, this is not what, what people, how they should be thinking about this. But I'm like, I'll, I'll work that sugar off if that's what I'm is it because do, right? Is it because you think you're not exercising enough? Because you didn't at that yeah. time you didn't link this to what you're eating because what you're eating is already um, following what they told you. So you're you're saying you went to the gym because they said you had to exercise. Is that what you think was happening? Exactly. Exactly. And then I ran into uh, one of the owners of the CrossFit gym, who, you know, and I I literally broke down. I had tears in my eyes. I'm like, what the hell am I gonna do? This I. And I was starting to believe my doctor. And there's nothing I can do about this. I just have this thing that's gonna that's gonna end up killing me, you know. And uh, and, and and my friend, uh, shoot, I just blanked out on his name. It's been a lot of years since I've seen this guy. Now um, I can't think of his name right now. But it, but he listened to me, and then he said, Pete. Dude, you're still eating the carbohydrates. And this was a very embarrassing moment for me because I have a PhD in biochemistry, right? I should know better. I should know better. And I hope your viewers agree. I should know better. And so should all these guys that are out there who are medical doctors. They should know better. But he suggested that I watch this uh, TED Talk and uh, so I did. I went home and uh, it was uh, a TED Talk produced by um, this famous doctor. Her name is Dr. Sarah Hallberg, who recently mm -hmm. died, not, not of chronic disease. And I watched her TED Talk. This was around two or three in the afternoon that day after annihilating myself in the, lab, uh, in the, in the gym. Um, I think I could barely walk for three days after that session. Um, and I watched her Ted talk and I was like, Oh my God, mm. how could I have not understood this? You know, I was like, what an idiot. And I went and I stood in front of the mirror in my bathroom where I could look at myself in the mirror. And I, I made eye contact with myself and I said, I won't say it on your podcast, all the language that I use, but I was like, I am not going to be a type two diabetic. I'm done with this today. I know what to Love do. It. And I went to the store and, uh, and I'm a biochemist. So I'm like, I know what my plate's going to look like tonight. And I started eating low carb literally that day. I did not tell my wife what was going on. It was about two weeks later that she asked me, she's like, <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> How come Epiphany. your dinner looks, our dinners are different now. And, and that's what I owned up to her because I was embarrassed. Mm. There was stig there's stigma attached to this too, with type two diabetes and the gout thing. Right. And I was embarrassed. I'm this guy, I'm this climber guy, this mountaineer. I've, I could, you know, if this was a podcast on, on living via the, the seat of your pants and surviving these near death things. I could tell stories all day long. I was that guy, right. That had pushed back against all of these things that should have killed me. And here I am with prediabetes. I'm a gout sufferer. And, and I have these images of this guy sitting around mm. with his feet up, drinking too much and, and eating bonbons. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. This was a big deal. Before that, and before that time, before you watched that TED talk, have how have you ever heard of it before? Uh, keto, that word, that term. No, but after the video and after eating that night, I I went directly mm. to Verda Health 
And in those days, I think it's still true, you can pull down their peer-reviewed papers and, uh, and, and print them out. And I did that in the process. I already knew pretty much how I needed mm -hmm. to eat, but I pulled their papers down and then I constructed my lifestyle directly from that. And I missed, I made a list of biomarkers directly from their papers. And, and that's what I used. Uh, I, I made this list and said, okay, from now on, this is my blood work. And of course the doctor refused. She's like, we're not doing that stuff. Why do you need to do that stuff? And so that's when I, I went out and I started contracting and paying for my own blood work. And that's how I know I reversed prediabetes in 52 days mm. because at the end of 52 days, my A1C was, uh, was 5.1 and my um, fasting glucose was completely stabilized. My cardiovascular risk markers were normalized. I mean, the whole, everything that Verta Health said happens on a ketogenic diet I, I was walking, talking evidence mm. of it, and and being a biochemist too helps too because uh, you you made sense of it like right there. Yeah, mm. exactly. That's pretty dramatic. Fifty two days. Uh, you you yeah. went you You're went strict cold turkey, right away. I I did absolutely. That doesn't mean I didn't have problems with cravings. Mm -hmm. You know, and and maybe it's the issue that you brought up earlier. Maybe maybe it was my fear. Yeah. Um, but that was coupled to my commitment because, you know, I got, I have plans. I'm going to be 65 this year and I'm back rock climbing as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my daughter just got married and they're going to be grandchildren. And I, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. You know, that, that grandpa who's in a nursing home with, with one foot cut off yeah. on oxygen. You know what? Sometimes we need that fear. Sometimes we need that fear because some people don't actually when they hear that news, I have a couple, like I said, I have a couple of friends and, and my dad and my mom also, they didn't express the fear that you're expressing. And because of that fear, you, it has now led you to finding out a solution that actually keto can actually reverse type two diabetes. And now your, is your gout is also reversed now, right? It's it's in remission. in remission. Okay. So I, I don't use the word reversal because I, I am probably the only one in the world that has actually come up with a, a new hypothesis of gout through literally years and years of sifting through the scientific literature from a lot of different areas. And uh, in order to come up with a better idea how this uh, serious inflammation actually happens. And where this is sitting now is uh, I'm trying to find somebody who is, who has a laboratory, um, who's willing, uh, to, to do some experiments to see, uh, to either prove or, or disprove what my hypothesis is. But on my YouTube channel, I ha there's a lot of people now that, um, who have sought me out and have had success mm -hmm with my way of eating, which is essentially ketogenic and putting their gout in remission. We can't use the word reversal because unlike Verda, I'm not a company with scientists that work for me. I have no way of doing clinical studies or any of that stuff that they've been able to do and actually show that, you know, you can reverse mm -hmm. this. So everything I'm talking about is anecdotal. What is the last flare up that you had? It was, uh, it was about a year ago, mm -hmm. but I need to qualify that because after going ketogenic, I, I had a minor flare about four months into it, <clears throat> and this gets complicated. And the reason that that happened is because when you first go on a low-carb diet, you start to produce the ketones. And <clears throat> in the process of keto adaption in those early months, you tend to overproduce the ketones. And the significance of this is that you start to put them out in the urine. Mm. And so your kidneys are excreting them. And part of the issue with that is that when it, they're excreting higher levels of, of ketones into the urine, they, the ketones actually compete for uric acid. So the uric acid rises. And one, one of the things that I believe about gout flares is it's not... Gout flares are most likely 
when somebody is undergoing a substantial rise in ketones, or excuse me, in uric acid, or a substantial decrease. It's the dynamic that matters. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to get it off into the weeds why I think that at the moment. So I had a minor flare about four months into, into this. And when I say minor, if you talk to anyone that, that has gout, a gout flare and you ask them to rank the pain, they're going to rank the pain somewhere about 10. All right. When, when you're ketogenic, because of the production of beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is sh shown to downregulate the inflammatory process, systemically and also in terms of gout, the gout flares themselves tend to be mild. So the flare I had four months in was on a scale of, of one to 10 was a one, mm. literally. The only reason I knew it was going on was because of the location. Um, now, later on, you asked me what happened a year ago. So your gout suffers after they become keto adapted, which at minimum takes anywhere from around three to four months. For those of us who are older, for me, it took over a year. And for, with my clients that are older like I am, this is turning out to be fairly consistent. It takes a, a long time before you can undo a lot of the damage that you've done relative to these key organs like liver, kidney, um, perhaps even in the brain, and so on. So in, after you keto, I just want to put, put it in perspective. Uh, a year is is still pretty good when in terms of uh, we're talking about chronic illness here, right? Where it's viewed to be you know irreversible, and we're talking about within a year you can reverse your 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 uh, your pro, your, di your diabetes or or yeah, right? you see you see normalization of mm. your uh, lipid panel relative to uh, the high carb, or excuse me, the, um, mm. the low carb diet. Um, you see, I saw improvement in my kidney numbers, in my liver numbers at that point. Um, uh, the A1C and the glucose, that tends to stabilize really, really fast within a couple of months. Literally, that's going to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. But some of these other things take longer. Okay. Now, the key thing is for the gout sufferers is that after they keto adapt, their uric acid, circulatory uric acid, either drops into the normal range, which seems to happen for some individuals, especially the obese ones that have lost significant weight. This seems to be mm -hmm. the correlation for them, which is an association. And then there's this other half of individuals of which I'm in that group that remain hyperuricemic, high uric acid, right at the top of the normal range between seven to eight megs per deciliter. So a year ago, for a variety of reasons, I don't know if you want me to get into those or not, I decided to go on a urate lowering drug, allopurinol. And so I started allopurinol. And one of the side effects can be that you get a gout flare when you start allopurinol. And that's in fact what happened. It was mild. You'll, again, on a scale of one to 10, I, I think I would have given it a two maybe. And it lasted a couple of weeks. Once, once I stabilized on the drug and my uric acid stabilized, this is an important point because when you start taking the allopurinol, the uric acid starts to come down and you have that dynamic. But once it stabilized and I stabilized on the drug, no more, uh, no more gout flares now. Mm. Now you can rightly ask me why go on all all then in the first place. And that has to do with the fact that high uric acid, uh, is strongly associated with cardiovascular disease outcomes. And what, what finally broke the straw on my camel's back and made me go, okay, I'm doing all opurinol was, was the realization. And there's, there's a ton of strong scientific clinical and, uh, data on this area, non-associational stuff that shows that in people that are hyperuricemic, they have crystallization of uric acid throughout their body in tendons and in ligaments, in the coronary, in the lining of the coronary 
system, in the, in the lining of the cardiovascular system, even on the valves of their hearts, in addition to crystallization in the kidneys um, uh, and in the liver. And so I looked at that and I just, I was like, all right, no, I'm not doing that. I need my uric acid to come down and I'm going to get it down. And that's where I have it today. It's between four to five mg per deciliter. Mm -hmm. And there's a variety of, of, of things I've done in addition to the allopurinol, which I only take on a very low dose in order to achieve that. But I believe that for people that are hyperuricemic, and again, when we were talking about reversal of, um, of these chronic diseases, the hyperuricemia most likely is because over decades of eating the standard American diet, the, the damage due to the hyperglycemia in my kidney is, is what has caused the damage that, that uh, where the kidney is mismanaging the excretion of, of uric acid. And, and also that's connected to uh, the disruption of glu glucose homeostasis. What, what a lot of people don't realize is that the modulation of glucose levels in your blood is not just being run by the liver. Most of it's being run by the liver, but 46% of it is being run by the kidney. And, and most likely this is being coordinated by your brain. So you've got these three players. And when you have kidney damage, specifically in the proximal tubules, which is where uric acid does its damage, which is also the place where you have the glucose modulation, then that can be a contributor not only to type 2 diabetes, but then once you reverse this condition, if, if the damage there is significant enough, you, I believe that you then remain hyperuricemic. Mm. And utilizing a urate-lowering drug down the road, uh, it may be prudent. That's a personal decision that, that you know, people have to make. And, and remember, I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not saying, okay, you should go do that. I'm saying you need to look at your system. Mm -hmm. And remember that you're in charge of your health. Your doctor is not in charge of your health. You're in charge of your health. The doctor is supposed to be an advocate for your health. Right. And this is coming no. back to what you asked me about earlier. What are the contributing factors to people saying, all right, I'm not going low carb. One of, one of those is that in our culture, there's this tendency to make the doctor uh, patriarchal. You do what they say. You have to do what they say. Don't argue with them and take the drug and be quiet. You know, and I think if, you, if a guy has a doctor like that, you need to go find a new one. You need to get to you need to get to somebody that where you can have a conversation, you know, where you can go. Okay, look, you just told me I'm type or pre diabetic and I'm a gout sufferer. You know, what are my options? Mm -hmm. And I believe it's the responsibility of of our medical professionals to know the science. I believe that's their responsibility. Just like as a biochemist, I think it was my responsibility to know that carbohydrates were causing me big problems. I should have understood that. I want to ask you one question. Right? If yeah. you had listened to your doctor and didn't do anything different, where are you today? Oh, I think I'd be full-blown type 2 diabetes. And I think it my gout, I think it would have been come roaring back. Yeah, that that's why you don't act. That's why you take control of your health, right? It, yeah. It's your responsibility, not your doctor's, right? Right. Because if... And I'm not saying what you put in your mouth is the only thing. I pay attention to my stress now, how my sleep is. And being 60 years old, the other part of my job is to help people who are my age know how, how they should be moving. Mm. What's, what's best for someone who's 60 to optimize their cardiovascular system and their organ systems so that, you know, we can age grace, mm. gracefully. Mm. I want to I wanna get to ask you this before we, uh, we end our conversation. There's a lot here that we've, uh, 
really talked about. I hope people are that are listening right now is taking notes because you know there's a lot of information here that's uh, that you can't get anywhere else. And um, I want to ask you this. You know, I want to get to your coaching. Does your coaching extend in a year or? What how how what does your coaching entail? And um, I want I want you to be able to um, take us through the step by step process and how you from from the intake form to you know onboard your clients. How 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 does it all work? So in our coaching, uh, what we do is we we do have an extensive uh, onboarding. So we have an initial uh, form that that these guys, okay, so we ask people to go to our website and on there they can uh, they can take a sugar assessment, which is literally only six questions. And the reason we ask them to do that is because we, we already understand that the biggest challenge is going to get them to stop eating sugar. And I'm using sugar as a broad umbrella mm-hmm. a component here. If they're buying salad dressing off the, off the shelf at the store, it's loaded with added sugar and they wouldn't even realize it. Right. Okay. And then, uh, the next step is, is a zoom, uh, with me. It's free. We, there's no like, and we just basically what I'm going to do there is have a conversation about, you know, what, where they are, what their lifestyle looks like. Um, you know, usually they have some sort of medical background they're going to be talking about, or if not, I'll be asking them those kinds of questions. And it's that's just really to find out if they're interested. If, for me to see if I can get a, a some kind of a picture about where they are, and whether or not we should go forward to the next part of mm. this. And if we go forward to the next part. Then we have an, a questionnaire because what I want to get to is what they're and, – and sometimes even our questionnaire is not enough with this. But to find out what they're eating literally every single day, everything they put in their mouth on any given general day for them, including even water, we want to know that even. And this is to get a clear picture of what they're really eating. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people think that they're healthy to start, that they're eating healthily to start with. And we know, we already know that that's not going to be true. And then as part of that questionnaire, we include a series of questions that's called UNCO. And the reason we're doing that is so that we can initially initiate, uh, excuse me, initially evaluate their level of, of sugar, uh, cravings. We, we want to know if there is a red flag for addiction. This is so prominent in what mm. we do. The, so if they answer yes to two out of those six questions, then what we're going to do at the next stage is ask them to go through our sugar analysis, which is all, all of this is uh, free up front. Um, and in the sugar analysis, this is very involved. It, it involves, an, uh, again, a, a Zoom session with my daughter to ascertain uh, all different aspects of their lifestyle, starting when they were kids. Uh, we, we looked, there's a whole range of different questions. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to know if there is a sugar addiction issue. And uh, so far, everyone that we've had do this, like I said, I'm trying to use neutral language Mm -hmm. here has some level of cravings and the reason we need to know this is because like i said earlier um we have a uh, a three-month program it can be three or four months depending on what the person wants to do that's going to be where one-on-one with me we we uh we develop the food plan they have weekly sessions with me there's uh um full-time texting with me and all that uh, to teach them how to eat the low carb lifestyle Mm -hmm. tailored to whatever their individual issues are, right? Uh, Cultural issues, you know, um, if if they are having a sugar issue, uh, there there are other things that we're going to do to approach this thing. And the goal for the end of the three months, uh, plus or minus, is to have them Stable to st- have them stabilized in, in their 
um, metabolic uh, profile. And then at the end of that program, uh, how much involvement they want with me mm. then becomes optional for them, right? They can decide how much of me they want one in there. We have a free free support group that they, they by then belong to. Um, you know, we have, uh, well, so after that, it's a la carte. They can decide how much of me they need. Mm. And, you know, we figure out expense relative to that uh, beyond that point. But at the end of three or four months, they should be settled in the system uh, if they've made the, the appropriate commitment. I want to ask you this last question, and I love that uh, you're taking some time to get to know them first, uh, you know, tailor your program to their needs is because there's no one size fits all. Everybody's case is different. That's why I love that your program. And um, I want to get to uh, ask you this last question. Um, and I think this is really important that uh, before anybody get into a program is in your experience, you know, coaching clients, I know you could probably see this, you know, in the beginning, what is, or what are the telltale signs that a client is eager to start this journey and see this through and become successful? What are those signs? They have to be, they have to be bottomed out is a good way to put it. Um, and I'm using, I'm using a metaphor there from, uh, the addiction community. And I realize as we talk about this, that a lot of people, there's a stigma with that. So let's just put it this way. They're in a place in their life where they realize that what they're doing is not working and that they need to do something that is completely different. And they're ready to commit to it. You know, they, they're they sick to the point where, all right, going down this road just clearly is not working. I have to do something different. And I'm ready to do something different, you know. And that's a pretty important place to be, uh, I have found. If, if people aren't ready, within a few weeks of getting onto the lifestyle, they're going to be out of it. They'll leave it. And, and that has to do, again, with coming back to the carbs and and it will because it will be because they've been pressured either you know covertly or overtly so it could be a spouse that just is like this is crazy um the social networks are are i'm just going to say i think some of the most difficult and will can drive them back out because you know they're going to go to a party if they haven't planned ahead for that inevitability there's going to be a relative there or there will be friends there. They're going to say, here, try some of this. And they need two things in order to avoid that. They need to be able to say, um, no, I'm sorry. I, I can't eat that. And the second thing that they're going to have to be able to do is, is stand yeah. up to the pressure that person's going to put them, on them. Because that person is not going That's to understand, huge. you know, the seriousness of, of this. And, uh, and just a little, this is what they're going to hear out of the gate. This person's going to go, surely you can have just a little of this. It's not going to hurt you. And truthfully, for a type 2 diabetic, just a little is probably going to activate this biochemical pathway I've been talking about. Because in those people, that pathway is usually hyperactivatable. Just takes a little bit of that, of that stuff and... You know, boom, you can you can hear a lot of people in this community. If you ever get the uh, the chance to interview uh, Dr. Rob Sivas, he will tell you, I just have to look. He, this is a quote. I just have to look at a glass of water and I gain weight. You're talking about somebody in, in this case where yeah. this pathway is hyperactivatable. Just a little bit of sugar yeah. is going to activate the pathway driving the obesity and the diabetes and and those individual and the cravings so literally this is the, this is very similar to being an alcoholic you know no alcoholic would expect to go to a bar and drink a shot with his friends and expect to be able to stop there e even if he is successful walking out of the bar at that moment 
probably the next day they're going to be right back on it because you're, you're not just activating these processes in the liver and the kidney, but you're also activating these processes again in the brain. People have to take it seriously and there is a way, but it is a simple change, but, um, it isn't easy. Um, coaches like, uh, Dr. Pete services like this are available for you. You can, you know, where, where can, where can they find you, Dr. Pete? They can find me at, uh, www.drpete and all one word, a N D T dot com. And they can find me uh, at Dr. Pete's keto club on YouTube. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Pete, for coming on and sharing your story. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are suffering needlessly. And, you know, like I said, people have to take this seriously again. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes fear actually leads us to, to greater things. And you, you, you were somebody that didn't take this lightly and took it seriously and led you to this path of uh, helping other people do the same. So thank you so much, Dr. Pete. Uh, it's really an honor to have you on and uh, love that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for the honor to speak today. And uh, I really appreciated the conversation. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you.